Welcome to the Monday edition of Anglican Unscripted. All right, you're looking at us and you're thinking, what a great representation of April Fool's Day right in front of you. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. And since it's April the 1st, I'm tempted to say this is the three white men who are transgendering and announcing it edition. But we'll move on from that to some, something rather better. Okay, welcome to show 498. That's two shows away from 500. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. First, you have responsibility as the viewer. You need to share this so we can grow our audience. You need to comment uh, so that uh, we know what you're thinking and what you feel about the episodes and uh, any corrections or additions you can add. Uh, if you can retweet this, that would be wonderful. That's, uh, that's where that little, you do that with your phone. Uh, sharing is wonderful. What else can we do? Um, that's about subscribe. We have f like 4,300 subscribers and there's like 80 million Anglicans. We need to work on our subscription rate. It's, it's time to, to time to up that a little bit. Gentlemen, George, Gavin, how you been doing? Long weekend? All well? Long weekend. Start of a wonderful work week. Start of a new month. Great days coming ahead. Sure. It's, it's spring, it's April. Gavin, it's how are you doing? Well, April is the cruelest month, as T.S. Eliot said. I'm doing very well. We're into summertime now. It's spring is really beginning to um, make its promises. And um, uh, I was traveling quite a lot last week and feeling pretty comatose over the weekend, but I'm, I'm fresh and ready to go. <laughs> we as a team have been discussing, along with your ideas, of how to best celebrate episode 500. And I think... Gavin came up with the best idea, and that's to have everybody who wants to uh, kind of give a, a little testimony or uh, a little, I watch Anglican Unscripted. Uh, could you explain what your idea a little bit, Gavin? Yes. Um, when I was a student chaplain, some of the best uh, events happened when I asked the students to, to, to talk instead of me, uh, mainly about their experiences of the Holy Spirit. Um, but it strikes me that, that there are a lot of people who 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 are the other side of what we do. And um, it would be nice for them to introduce themselves to one another, but also, I think, to talk about their sense of discernment of what God is doing uh, for the kingdom through through this. So it's a way of asking people perhaps to, to offer 35, 30 to 45 seconds of, I watch Anglican Unscripted because, and I like it because, and this is who I am. Um, it can be done on a smartphone and, and one can send the video to Kevin very quickly, shouldn't require editing, keep it under 45 seconds, and then we can involve a lot of people and the, the, the most colorful people, and obviously the ones who say the nicest things, make it onto the show, and everyone else make, makes it into the library, which will be available for us all to see and enjoy. Yeah, no matter what, if you... We're, we're, uh, we're also going to be keen on diversity. We don't just want to have our, our wives, cousins, brothers, and nephews <laughs> speaking. We'd love to have people. We have we receive emails from South Africa, New Zealand, England, United all across the United States China, and Canada. Russia, yeah. Um, so, so we would be you know we have viewers in Croatia who contact us very frequently. But we would like to hear because I sometimes people assume that everybody who watches is just like them, and uh, that's sort of the default reaction. And I think you'd be surprised, you viewers the diversity of uh, backgrounds of the people who watch this show. So and I make a special plea to, to, to Justin. Justin, if you want to contribute, you'd be most welcome. <laughs> of course he would. So what you do is you get your smartphone, you click on the camera uh, button, and everybody has the video function. So you click record on your video, and it would be something like this. Um, ooh, I, I, I have the camera face the wrong way. You want the camera <laughs> facing you, so... There we go. So the camera's actually facing me. And you. Do, this is Pope Francis. And I've loved the program. And I'm recording from the Vatican. And I've watched since episode five. Something like that. And uh, we would encourage anybody else, you know, who watches the program to... I need to turn that off now. To do that. And just uh, the email address you're going to send this to or a link to is going to be anglicantv at gmail.com. And we're going to make two videos. One video is the, the, the diversity that makes it into the show, episode 500. And then there's the B-roll of everybody who sent something. So 
um, at at most, this is going to be very encouraging to people uh, to see who watch, who else sits down and on April first is watching Anglican Unscripted. Kevin, I, I think I, that's that's the point that I want to hit on um, encouragement. Um, this is not a vanity project uh, of the three of us. We we do this because we feel called by God to to speak the truth, to offer encouragement and support. When, when I was in GAFCON in Jerusalem, the three of us, uh, Gavin uh, introduced me to a man who came up for him who lived on one of the uh, uh, Western Isles of Scotland, who was, in essence, all by himself. He's a Scottish Episcopal priest who had withdrawn from his diocese over the heresy in that part of the world. And he shared with such fervor and strength the, the, the sense that he was part of a wider Christian fellowship through this show and do you remember that uh gavin i'll let could you uh, no, sort of I'll, flesh that out? well I'll, I'll never i'll never forget it and and i i think the important thing is what are we doing here spiritually for the kingdom this isn't a church exactly but it is a kind of fellowship uh it's a fellowship of people who who, lo who love jesus who are within the embrace of the anglican tradition and and who've got a keen sense that we're all in a struggle and what we're trying to do is encourage one another in the struggle. And if we manage to encourage you, we'd be very grateful if you could now encourage us. <laughs> and that's what, the, and and also therefore everybody else by by contributing to this. And and how and how this work encourages you. I mean, uh, are we just so darn funny that you just have to come back week after week because there's nothing else on TV? Or is there something that c connects to you? As you know, this fellow from the Scottish Isles speaks of being he under he has a sense of being part of catholic christendom he's not alone and to me hearing that was just such a wonderful uh affirmation of the purposes that kevin had when he started all this mm. uh how many years ago it's been kevin i five, a long time I hope six, seven uh, years. Uh, if we count the years we get depressed yeah, we've done 500 episodes in one year, George. That's yeah, that's the way I got to look at it. Um, now, there was a comment this week about, uh, Kevin, you don't talk enough. And I want to really examine my role here. My role is that of a DJ. My first job in college was a DJ. And I would pick the best records to keep the audience happy. And that's something that was very so good. So you're the guy who would do the tractor pull commercials on the radio. Yeah. Monster truck, monster truck. Yeah, of course, that was me. So, uh, it is such, I'm here to help direct my guest and co host on the show uh, so that we have something cohesive and entertaining for the audience. We're not here for Kevin's theology, but Kevin's theology is represented here. And it's just, it's the way it works. And I am very proud of having a minor role amongst some of the greatest minds in Anglicanism. Kevin, uh, it's, only, it's only minor in terms of the amount of time George and I speak. It's not minor in terms of intensity or depth. And, and I, I do like it when I speak and I make a comment and people go, Kevin, that was very wise. Yeah, okay, okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Kevin, you're so far thought. Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate that. But um, I'm amongst greats and I, and I get to play this role. It's a key role. And I don't have to have one third the show represented by my thoughts and my theology. I get to participate uh, in this uh, with so many people. In the since 2006, uh, Anglican TV has been to every continent except Antarctica, and it has been the greatest journey personally for myself and hopefully for you who've watched the videos and seen a church try to reform itself. It's it's an awesome thing to to be a part of. And we've bribed officials in over a dozen countries, <laughs> gotten, gotten boarded was the wrong train, <laughs> boarded the wrong trains for trips into the deep desert. And, uh, yeah, it's been a ride. So we should move on to the news. So don't forget, send your videos to Anglican TV at gmail.com. We're going to put them all together. It'll be a little work, but episode 500 will be a lot of fun. George, let's move on to the news. Gavin. Uh, you sent me a link to a story about our friend, and uh, uh, not really Christian yet, Jordan Peterson. So let's talk about what happened and um, what it means. 
We're going to do two university stories in this show, one Justin Welby and the mm. University of Kent, uh, and one Jordan Peterson and the University of Cambridge. And they're linked because um, the, the forces of progression, what I would continue to call cultural Marxism, because I think it's the most accurate term, though the left are trying to rubbish it and stop people using the term, because I think it tells so much truth. But the forces of cultural Marxism are, are, are working very hard to close down uh, proponents of free speech and free thought uh, and, and the Judeo-Christian tradition. When Jordan Peterson came to speak at the Cambridge Union, uh, and if you haven't seen it on, on YouTube, look it up. It's very good. He did one at Cambridge, one at Oxford. They were incredibly popular and really very powerful. Millions, millions of people have watched them, I believe. They really have. So it was no surprise that members of the Divinity Faculty then said, well, since you're on leave from the UFT, uh, why don't you come and spend some time as a visiting fellow? It's what universities do. Um, the students who then heard of that were so outraged, they tried to stop it. And the really astonishing thing, there's a very interesting article in the press today by Douglas Murray, who wrote about the death of, of Christian Europe, who is saying that many people thought that perhaps the progressive PC uh, stupidities of, of a student and a minor faculty culture didn't really reach all the way up the tree. But it turns out it reaches right the way to the very top of the tree at Cambridge. And after having had a delegation of, from the students' union, the university withdrew its invitation to him. Now, the, the reason this Douglas Murray makes the very interesting point, every time somebody tries to rubbish Peterson in the public square, whether it's uh, Cathy Newman or uh, any other university, they usually end up looking stupid. There is something real and profound and authentic about Peterson's contribution to philosophical debate that, that breaks through in the end and it'd be interesting to see what happens. But the, this took place at the, at the same, uh, just before um, an event that happened at Liberty University. And George, you may want to talk about this because we'll, we'll perhaps we'll, we'll reflect on whether Peterson is the noble Stoic, as somebody once described him, or a card-carrying pre-Christian Jungian, or an example of the First Covenant. It'd be quite helpful to try and explain a little bit more about Peterson's relationship with Christianity, but it took a real jump, didn't it, at, at Liberty University this week? Yeah, the, on Friday night, uh, Jordan Peterson was on stage with, I believe, the Dean, I want to say Larry Nazer, uh, I know Nazer is his Larry, last name, yeah of Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. And they were doing uh, sort of the panel discussion that Jordan Peterson has done so well in so many venues and before the student audience, uh, before a student audience. And a young man rushed the stage and he was distraught, emotionally distraught, and he was weeping and sobbing and help me, help me. And it was just a initially frightening and then very painful moment because here's a man a breakdown he wanted jordan peterson uh to help uh, uh get rid of the demons in his soul in his mind in his psyche and he had put so much into put the person of jordan peterson and this was filmed continuously and it's been the subject of some blog posts i don't think i've seen it in the regular secular media and what was fascinating was that Peterson offered some platitudes. That's it. But yeah. and the, but you could see on his face the concern, the care, but he didn't have the language or the vocabulary or the weapons. And the dean of Liberty Seminary, a Liberty University, began to pray with this man and and what was so profound was to see the clash between psychology and and divinity in the sense of the response of the, the Liberty University fellow, uh, Nazer, was to offer sustenance of, to the man's soul. And Jordan Peterson offered platitudes. And I think, Gavin, you, you've got the quote that came down perfectly at the end where, now this was not in conflict. They weren't, uh, and you know, perhaps a dean of a university is more uh, used to dealing with distraught students. So he, he I was don't wish to, but there was a quote at the end, Gavin, hmm. that I, I think you really should explore that struck me profoundly. Uh, he was the director of spiritual development and uh, one of the things that people mentioned as they wrote about it was the way in which 
whilst he deferred to Peterson as an international figure, he brought to the whole event a degree of spiritual authenticity, existential weight, which clearly showed. And uh, and as they prayed for the for the soul and the psyche of this young man, Peterson was was very moved on for two reasons, which I think were pretty obvious. One was um, he's a very empathetic man; he's a therapist, and he was profoundly touched by the the pain of this man who stood up and said, "I am unwell. I am unwell. I need help." And uh, and then so the the uh, uh, I wish we remember his name. I'm sorry to forget his name. The, but anyway, the the director of spiritual development, Na Nazer, uh, Nazer, N A S S E R, and then. Um, Peterson quite clearly, uh, there was no therapeutic technique which would deal with this level of distress. This was a moment for deliverance, perhaps exorcism, but certainly deliverance. And, and the deliverance appeared to have been effective. And Peterson looked out of his depth, and this is not to criticize him, but simply to say that what was exposed here was the need for a junction uh, between where Peterson was and where the kingdom of heaven is. And so as they talked about it, Peterson was asked for, for advice to give and he, to students who felt like this man. And Pete, Jordan Peterson gave some really quite, quite, quite helpful advice, but it nowhere, it nowhere near reached the level of spiritual and existential crisis they'd just seen. And one of the things that the wonderful interviewer did was every so often he, he brought Jesus and the kingdom in. And in a very pithy statement, he said, Jordan, you know, the 12 rules are absolutely great. And they're really important and congratulations on it. But, you know, they don't work without getting to know the ruler who gave the rules. And this was such a pithy moment. And Peterson's up for this. He was described by one of the bloggers as, as the noble Stoic. And that the kind of Marcus Aurelius figure. And, and, and indeed, he is. And it, there's a great deal to be said for noble Stoicism. And if anyone hasn't read Marcus Aurelius, he writes some very good stuff. But he comes as this combination between a, as a Stoic and a Jungian. And part of the problem for Peterson is that he's recognizing the truth in the maps of the kingdom of heaven, but he doesn't know any of its power and reality. To my, to my mind, he's a bit like an Old Testament figure, almost Nicodemus, really. He knows the law. He knows the rules. He knows how the place is organized, but he hasn't yet been born again. And now the exciting thing is, the point at which he begins to realize there's a gap in front of him he needs wings to fly with. Uh, and I reckon this moment would have come as close as any to provoking him. Apparently, he watched the worship beforehand and, and was moved by the worship of this really rather splendidly spirit-infused Christian body. So he's on the cusp, and as well as observing him, we should pray for him. Well, I think for the last six years, he's been considered the Jesus of psychology. The Jesus of conservatism, the, the Jesus of the people who are looking around and may not see this as a faith issue, but uh, see this as a logic issue or see this as a, uh, you know, we ha we're coming up against something that just doesn't have any reason to it. And he's this Jesus of reason. And he represents and he's able to answer all questions. And he has an apologensia about him for what's going on in culture. And there's no wonder people are running up to him and say, help me, save me. The world doesn't make any sense. Kevin, one of the things I want to add there, if I may, because that's, just, that, that, that's a point so well made, is that part of his appeal is he's doing what Anglican Unscripted is trying to do. I'm not trying to gab on his coattails. He's telling the truth. And when you, you know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. When you start telling the truth as best you can in an unvarnished, courageous way, you lay open a diagnosis of what's wrong. And that allows people then to begin to move forward, which you can't do if you produce a misdiagnosis and untruth. And you're, you're quite right. People are, I love the idea he's being seen as the Jesus of therapy. Uh, he, he is. But of course, he knows that he's not. And that's one of the reasons why. Uh, we uh, our hope is that as he encounters the real Jesus uh, and the real the real depth psychology the real truth he may decide he wants to surrender his enormously tough self uh, and fall into the arms of the living Christ but that's a great way of describing him the Jesus of psychotherapy uh, the the two two issues I want to raise on on this exact point one I encourage people to search out the video on the internet on YouTube 
I have always admired Jordan Peterson's brain. I've admired his abilities. I just think he's fantastic. I enjoyed reading him. In watching the videos and looking at his face and sort of experiencing that encounter, I like him as a human being now. And I, I don't mean to say, isn't that wonderful? George now likes him. But in Jordan, in this interview, I, in my experience as a priest, I've seen this before. It's that cathartic moment when people who know the story of Jesus, who have studied it, who all of a sudden they're starting to get it in a way that is not intellectual, but spiritual. Now, I may be overpromising, and he may be running far away from this encounter, but God was present in that interaction, in the this in that situation. It was almost a biblical scene of the man born blind coming and Jesus rubbing his eyes. Not that John Peterson is Jesus, but but Jordan Peterson is the observer to the miracles of Christ. I, I'd like to make a fellow, Kevin, I'm so sorry. Well, uh, this is where we need to stop. And we have a very educated audience. I'm going to say 95% of you have a four-year degree. But I'm not sure all of you know what a union is. And I want Gavin to take a minute and just talk about the philosophy here that Jordan Peterson is visibly as I can tell subscribes to. I'd also like to add a personal bit to it because sure. because in a sense um, I, I was doing something similar to Jordan Peterson in my 25 years at Sussex. I was also a senior lecturer in psychology and I was very I heard about him because of his work and when he wrote Maps of Meaning I went oh rats this man has written the book I wanted to write and he's quite clearly cleverer than me and further ahead of the curve than I am but we believe in and we're teaching the same curriculum and the same issues uh, and so it was extraordinary to me when he broke out into the public space but I, the other reason is I too was a Jungian for a while. I, I was teaching Freud and Jung and Adler and William James, but I, I adored Jung. And the reason Jung is so delightful uh, is because he allows people to talk about life in spiritual language without committing themselves to any kind of discipleship, metaphysical obedience, whatever. It's a kind of, it's, a, it's the language of the spiritual voyeur. Carl Gustav Jung was, a, was effectively um, a new Gnostic. He had the most astonishing psychic gifts. He got involved in this whole thing through uh, attending mediums where his cousin did some nasty, nasty channeling. Those of us who know this thing will immediately sense the occult was around. The occult was very much around. There are some amazing moments when he and, and Freud experienced uh, psychic phenomena that make the hair stand up on the back of your neck and are almost certainly occult, but occult presenting as good. F F Jung's great problem was that he he moves, he, he, when he uses the word God, he's talking about the ego, um, or, or more importantly, since that's a Freudian term, the self with a capital right. S. And so instead of being saved, Jung is the great messiah of personal development. Whenever you hear anybody say, talk about people's coming to their full potential, they're really channeling third-rate Jungian psychology because this idea of potential is what he describes as individuation. So there are two absolutely very serious, there are three serious, Monty Python, there are four, there are three <laughs> very serious <laughs> Spanish Inquisition skits coming on. One is, one is the mistaking of the, uh, the self for God. The self becomes a new God. Uh, the next is that he, he entirely uh, confuses good and evil. Uh, good and evil, light and dark, become uh, alternative manifestations of each other. And you deal with the darkness by integrating it rather than refuting it. This is so anti-Christian. The implications of it are enormously profound. The next thing he does is, of course, is, is a synthesis of, of male and female, animus and anima, and the transgenderism and gender dysphoria that we're dealing with is another implied function of Jung's particular stages of of development where there is a an integration of the two without keeping uh, necessarily a distinction so at every level jung is the gnostic messiah of anti-christian spirituality and the problem is the more you adopt a jungian worldview as i did and peterson does the more hardened you get to aspects of the gospel the thing that moved me was that in 2008 i was attacked by the devil 
for three nights. It's an interesting story, uh, and it 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 it's the reason I tell the story is because my reaction to this was just like Jordan Peters on stage. Oh my God, there's the devil. What do we do now? <laughs> He's not supposed to exist, and 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 nothing we have in our Jungian armory deals with him. He's supposed to be a pit of darkness that gets wonderfully integrated with the light to produce a new synthesis of psychic energy. You know, but what the literally what the hell is this? So um, I was propelled from uh, nearly uh, from nearly a quarter century of, of, of Jungian heterodoxy firmly back into Christian orthodoxy by an experience with raw evil. And one of the reasons I'm so interested in this episode that George drew my attention to was I think Peterson's having this experiencing an aspect of the same journey. When you meet when you meet evil and you discover that the demonic and Satan are profoundly real, working very hard, and you learn their smell and their fingerprints. Nothing is more likely to drive you into an authentic biblical Christianity. And it's, it's really quite One, exciting that pizza may have the experience. I wanted to add on to this. One of the failures of our society as a whole is the inability to recognize evil. Uh, Jordan Peterson just did a book tour in New Zealand, and immediately after this mosque shooting in Christchurch, a chain of bookstores withdrew from sale Peterson's books, saying that in this climate, uh, we cannot allow his books to be distributed. Now, the same chain of bookstores will sell you Mein Kampf by Adolf Hitler. It's okay to sell the calls for the elimination of Judas, Judas, the Jews, but for uh, Peterson's self-help book to be condemned as worse than Mein Kampf just tells you of the so many of our society have the inability to distinguish right from wrong okay well let's move on from the jordan peterson show and talk about the justin welby kent show <laughs> uh i don't think if you followed anything inc you've seen the story where um the people in charge of kent university have heard some complaints from the students and some grumbling you know if lambeth is going to be held here and the discussion is whether or not bishops can bring their same-sex married partners or can't. We want to have a voice in this. Currently, you're not allowed to bring a same-sex uh, gendered uh, spouse with you. Kent University doesn't like that. And they sent a letter publicly to Justin uh, regarding this. And now... We are finding there's attacks, not just from the right on Lambeth, but from the left. And there does not seem to be, even though Justin Welby really, really wants it, a middle way on this. You're not allowed to be in the middle. You're hot or you're cold. And let's talk about this. Uh, Justin wants Lambeth 2020. I'm not sure it's going to happen. The, uh, un the University of Kent of Canterbury's uh, governing body uh, in response to student protests, has written a stern letter to the Lambeth organizers saying that they will provide accommodation for the same sex partners of the three bishops who will be there who are out and gay and married and all this and that. And because the university will not countenance uh, behavior which they believe to be discriminatory. And this it's extraordinarily funny in some respects. I mean, on one level, the crazies have seized the, uh, the institutions, but they did that a long time ago. But Justin Welby's, I think, Kevin, your point of Justin Welby trying to split the difference between the two is no longer possible in England. I remember 10 years ago when uh, Colin Coward uh, sort of jokingly said at the Lath Lambeth conference, you know, it's a good thing Peter Akinola is not going to be here this time because he could be arrested uh, for hate speech, for giving one of his impromptu comments about the sinfulness of homosexual conduct. We're now at a point where that's not just an arch comment. That could be the truth. Well, not Why? only that, but that, I mean, I, mean, I, I remember when I... I was on the other side of the of the doctrinal fence at the time, and I remember seeing Akinola <laughs> attempt deliverance on the people who were who were the LGBT people who were heckling him, and and it it was the most extraordinary event. But for my mind, it's become almost a seminal, uh, a semiotic 
representation of what's going on here. You have you have got Akinola saying, I'm in the face of evil and I know how I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to deliver the people who need delivering. Uh, and then, of course, the other people who are, who are laughing and rubbishing him. But, but, but that one moment, as you've just said, Kevin, uh, shows that the battle lines are drawn in terms of worldview and diagnosis. And there is no middle way and poor poor justin welby is being caught at a point hoping there'd be enough time for a middle way but it looks like events have overtaken him and there won't be one quite what he does now in terms of whether or not he succumbs to the pressures of his secular host saying okay we have to invite these people but that will of course have a huge kick on events effect in the amongst the orthodox and the anglican Un communion or whether he says well we can't use a secular place anymore we have to go back to where we had it before which i, I think you guys suggested was was westminster abbey. Yeah, abbey yeah i i actually was present when it was emmanuel chuck Wuma, who's the archbishop of the niger delta uh, tr uh exercised richard kirker who at the oh, time wow. was the head of the uh uh I forget it. It's changed his name. The the British uh, Gay and Lesbian uh, Church Organization, and I was standing with Stephen Bates of the Guardian outside the tent. We were watching this, and Stephen Bates was horrified, and I didn't say anything because I was young in my career at this time and didn't want to be unpopular. But I thought this is what you're supposed to be doing, <laughs> um, and it was such a clash of worldviews because there was not any animus whatsoever from Archbishop mm -hmm. Chukwuma. He's a flamboyant archbishop who wears aviator sunglasses, and he has a bit of an African dictator look. He dresses a little too flashily for most uh, Englishmen. But there was no animus whatsoever, and he truly believed that the views that Kirker was spouting were uh, of the devil. And Kirker truly believed that what he was sp speaking was logical and godly. Mm -hmm. And... It, actually, it was what, what a Lambeth should be, where you have that confrontation and clash of the two, and each try to persuade the other and change the other. We're now into a world where the junior common room at the University of Can at Canterbury don't even want people to raise the whole discussion because it may discomfort some of their members. 10, 20 years ago, when we had the, we could talk about these things and we would encourage this debate now that debate's forbidden. Mm. The, the left has basically said there can be no discussion of these issues anymore. The governmental left, the authorities, the institutions, and there is now a real, you know, a Nigerian Archbishop Chukwuma is still Archbishop of Biafra, of, of the Niger Delta, which is the Biafra region. He could go, to, he could be arrested if he attempted to do this again. Um, a, it, it is ironic that Indaba was the beginning of the end. We're now at the end. Uh, there's no longer discussion. We're not, you know, we're not going to pursue any reasoned response to this. We're just going to move on. And, and Justin moving on, seeking peace, seeking unity with those left in his church. Um, God bless him. But I don't see this working out because he's stuck now appeasing his society. And... There's a there's a flip side to this because it's the use of secular force to compel thought. Mm. Uh, we ran a little story in Anglican Inc. where the Archbishop of Kenya, Jackson Oli Sapit, uh, was protesting because the Kenyan government has now allowed a non-governmental organization, a charity, to be formed to advocate for gay and lesbian civil liberties, as they call it. And the Anglican Church in Kenya says, so we have sodomy laws, what they're advocating for is illegal, Therefore, the government should ban an organization that is seeking to uh, promote illegal activities. And I'm sympathetic to that, but at the same time, when you use the state to compel thought and speech, even if, and, and our Jack, old Jackson Oli Sapat, I agree with his conclusions about what is godly and moral, but I think we're in a world where the left in the West is now using the state to compel thought of people in Canada being arrested and fined and Carolyn Farrow in the UK being investigated by the police because she calls a biological man who thinks he's a woman a man. They're using the state to compel thought. And whether it's from the left or the right, I just think that's a mistake. Indeed.
The, the birds are tweeting in the background. <laughs> <laughs> oh, people are retweeting our episode. Oh, you gotta watch this. Oh, they just you know. So, and I understand that. That's fine. Um, well, guys, I think we've come up what four hours? No, thirty-five minutes. I think that's good enough for today's episode. What do we Kevin, want? Kevin, I wanted to talk about Indian corruption, but I guess that'll wait. Well, then. that's the, you know, geez, that would take a long, long time. And we know, I don't know if people know this. A couple weeks ago, we changed our time in uh, America to spring forward, and England doesn't do it at the same time. England did their final spring forward, and now you guys have permanently uh, outlawed this time zone thing. Oh, I hope so, but I haven't heard that we have. I mean, I wish we would, but I haven't heard it happened yet. Okay, I heard some country, and maybe it's not England, uh, decided that they're not going to do it anymore. And, and Gavin, tell us in less than 30 seconds, what's happening with Brexit in Parliament? We've been yes, getting please. a lot of... <laughs> we've been getting a lot of... Uh, a lot of screwy things happening here. That Evidently, your government has collapsed or is collapsing, and the, uh, the <laughs> Irish have invaded Belfast, or what's going on? Well, uh, the, uh, the outcome is either going to be completely wonderful or absolutely terrible. I can't tell which. The newspapers, it, it's impossible to know. The problem is that the uh, uh, the House of Commons is a pro-Europe institution and there is no mechanism for getting them to vote to do what the referendum insisted on. And so we're coming to a crisis where either they will decide to ignore the referendum which would have all kinds of eruptions. Uh, but what's, that's what everybody expects. Or they will decide to go against their own personal views and allow Britain to, they always yeah, crash out. But it's like, essentially hit the time scale, the end of the time scale in a fortnight's time and go out on WTO rules. So nobody knows which of those two is going to happen. The assumption is that they will be unable to let go of their own power and prejudices and ignore the referendum and then we'll stay in the European community on some basis for some indeterminate length of time. Okay, Gavin, if I may ask Kevin, if I, I want to interrupt because I want to ask Go Gavin professional <laughs> advice, editorial <laughs> advice. I get press releases from just about all the Church of England bishops and I do triage where 90% of them get thrown in the trash. Um, Thank you, uh, Gavin, and I, and all the viewers to England Inc. Thank you. You know, Bishop Bishop uh, so and so opens Saint Swithin's uh, Hospital uh, Infants Ward. Uh, it's usually the majority of uh, press releases. There are some Church of England bishops. I just got something from the bishop in Europe, who is essentially saying that Europe, we Brits who live in Europe, are ashamed of our country because the Church, the our, our it is a sin to go against. Uh, to, to pull out of the European Union. And I've been sort of, you know, like, okay, you've got a political bishop. We have a few of those in the Episcopal Church. But I haven't seen anything from any bishop on the other side. I've got a collection of a dozen or so press statements and comments and off-the-cuff published remarks of Church of England bishops saying how stupid the people are to have voted for Brexit. Yet there's nobody coming in the other direction. It, am I just not subscribing to the right people? No, there is only one. Archbishop Cranmer, the political and religious blogger, explored exactly this point and said there are none. And then Mark Rylands, who was the suffragan bishop of Shrewsbury, but who retired early um, for reasons that were never explained and is now a vicar in Exeter and an assistant bishop. He was the only one who spoke out in saying that there was virtue in the Brexit position theologically and politically. Um, so I think that's put down at 98.87% of the bishops are on one side and Mark Ryland's exercise is supposed to represent 0.13. Whatever it is, there aren't any. But but the important point about this is that the, the institution of the Church of England has so managed to filter the personality requirements to hold Episcopal office in the Church of England that they are monochrome in this particular aspect as they are in so many others. The theological implications of this are not about Brexit, they're about state control in the appointment of a, to the Episcopal office. Let's, by state control, I mean, I mean, I mean, sorry, I shouldn't say state, I mean the, the, a similar view to the state as in, uh, you know, a monochrome cultural view. 
I, I like the compare House it. of Lords or the yeah. House of or the Judiciary or the yeah. Oh my. This is a great chance to compare apples to apples. May, your prime minister, voted against Brexit. She didn't want did not want to Brexit, but but she was put in charge of Brexiting. Something she did not believe in, and you are in absolute chaos. Justin Welby does not share the same theology on marriage as the majority in the Anglican Communion. Therefore, you have absolute chaos. Kevin, that's not quite true. Okay, where am I wrong? Yes, Justin Welby will tell the Communion Partners bishops in the United States and Canada, the conservative bishops, that he supports the traditional position on marriage. But yes, he will also tell Kevin Robertson in Toronto and Mary Glasspool in New York, the partnered gay bishop and lesbian bishop, that he supports their position. So it depends on whom Justin Welby is talking to, whether or not he supports the traditional position. Can okay. I say also, I think, I think there is a, almost a, a young division in terms of fact and feeling. So one of the most sensible comments I heard was that uh, in the, the interpretation of the referendum question, do you want to leave, was understood by Brexiteers to be, uh, uh, sorry, by Remainers to be, do you like foreigners? In other words, are you a xenophobe? And so they said, yes, we like followers, so we want to stay. The question of do you want to leave was understood by Brexiteers as a political question, which of course it is. Do you like being governed by foreigners, whether you like them or not? And they said, no, we don't like being governed by foreigners, so we want to leave. In other words, the question was heard differently by both, but, but one in an emotional, therapeutic sense, and the other in an, an analytical, factual sense. And I think the same thing is true over gay marriage and, and the other issues. The Church of England understands the question about gay life to be, do you love your neighbor enough to let him do what he wants with his erotic and amorous inclinations? And so it says, we do, and therefore we're in favor of it. And those who are against this particular project say, do you want to do what the Lord your God has told you to do in Holy Scriptures? And they say, yes, we do. So they're against it. Again, it's a matter of, 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 of emotion versus analysis and, and misunderstanding, I think, of what the question actually means. Yeah, that's a good sum. All right, guys, we had a wonderful April Fool's episode. I'm glad you guys watched us on April Fool's Day. That was really special. Um, again, please grab your phones record a quick 45 second testimonial of who you are and why you love Anglican Unscripted. This is not for George, this is not for Gavin, this is not for Kevin. This is to be encouraging to all the other people who watch this. Some will make the episode 500, some are gonna make the long tape. I hope it's a tape of an hour long of all the different testimonials of people uh, who like the show. Yes, George? My wife uh, is an avid video, uh watcher on facebook and youtube but they always seem to be videos involving cats cats can can we yes if you videotape yourself with can your you cat, add that's gonna yeah, make I, it I, I think that may increase our popularity if you can work in a cat or maybe a small dog mm -hmm. uh, uh birds are fine too animals i always think uh add to our demographic uh, profile I can't, you can't go wrong. You add any animal, any funny situation. Um, I guess we're going to call this the Anglican Challenge. That's what we're going to call this. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. We are trying to be fools for Christ on April the 1st, 2019.